Thank you very much, Elina. Can you hear me properly? Can you see the slides as well? Yes, everything is fine. OK, wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to have those uh, few minutes uh, to present uh, an idea, um, kind of a methodological idea, uh, in order to try to let the changes that has been mentioned um, by uh, Stephen uh, Heppel, I think it's the proper name, um, very inspiring talk, by the way. So um, I will try to give some um, concrete um, process, I would say, or ideas uh, for uh, people in um, schools all over the world to uh, try to implement change. Um, the, the presentation is called Six Steps Toward Innovation in Schools. And I will start with step number one very quickly. Just before that, uh, I also have a Twitter account, so you feel free to um, connect. I would be very happy to uh, go on with the um, exchanges on um, education. Um, and uh, what you can see here is the my, my school and a special place in the school uh, called the Future Classroom Lab, inspired by European Schoolnet, as uh, Elena said. And I will try to share the process of it instead uh, of the outcomes, because uh, I think this is uh, maybe the best way uh, to get inspired and to see how we can actually do uh, things in our own context. Um, this is where I, my school is located, very between, let's say, for foreigners, Paris and Bordeaux, which is quite wide, but uh, Poitiers is a, a nice town where the Futuroscope is a, a quite famous amusement park, if you s maybe know it. The school is next, very nearby. So the first step is indeed bringing people together to try to see how we can actually innovate. But then innovating for me uh, has to be precise a little bit. And um, because most of the time we have great ideas everywhere around the world in every classroom. And I would say that actually innovation is happening every day in every uh, with every teacher, because for me, innovation is, first of all, trying to find a new solution uh, to a problem that we have. And this problem, we have it in a specific context. So this is a problem I have. Maybe some people have the same problem somewhere else in the world, but it's not exactly in the same conditions. So maybe my solution uh, is not going to be like the best solution for them. So what we need is uh, to, in order to find best solution to our problems, um, I think the first part is to actually bring people together. We do need schools that actually do more than just teaching. And for that, we need more than just teachers and probably more than just students. That's why what we did in 2015, we actually gathered um, stakeholders, school stakeholders. And what you see here is a student along with uh, someone from the local authorities, another student, a school inspector, which is like a head teacher in France, and also a researcher. So this is, a, let's say, a focus group. And um, what we try to do there, we try to create a space that could actually embody um, the innovation aspect we want to develop in our school. So of course we could we could innovate, as I said, any with any time anywhere. But if we want it to be um, something that we have in common, something we do together, then we might need some places to uh, embody this uh, idea. And the place could be like an object to think with, an object to innovate. And this is what I think a lab, uh, innovation lab is. So what we did, uh, we actually tried to find a common language uh, between parents, researchers, um, school inspectors, students, teachers, and all. Um, not always easy if we talk about the what the curriculum would be like the subject mostly curriculums are um, a series of subject instructions subject based instructions so um, what we thought what would be more interesting is to have this common language about not the what we should learn but how we should learn it and that could change a lot. So the what we learn is um, what I call uh, subject-based curriculum. But the how we do it, how we learn it, 
is mostly the 21st century skills that we have the learners um, being able to learn by them, themselves and um, like lifelong learning. So um, for instance, you can actually teach the Second World War um, to students and it's also very important in order not to have the Third World War again. So of course the content is very important, but what if you teach Second World War trying to develop uh, collaboration between students, trying to uh, work on their critical thinking skills and also help them to um, may run a project so they have to self-regulate. Then what's happening there is not only you inform them about the Second World War, but you can also give them some higher tools to make sure that this, this doesn't happen again because people will actually uh, be able to understand better each other. So um, the whole, how we learned it was, was uh, one of the key idea we actually discussed on with the parents, with the researchers and all. The goal was to actually create a scenario before creating the space. So first of all, we need a reason to do it. Let's say we want the students to be uh, more collaborative uh, in, in more collaborative situations. Um, so we need to create a scenario for that. So um, hopefully we had at that time the beginning of the FCL toolkit. That was a um, sort of a methodology to create new scenarios. Uh, but today we are even more equipped because uh, thanks to this um, wonderful project we've been running for three years now, the Novigato project, we also have the scenario tool that uh, can help us getting inspired by new ways of uh, teaching and learning. And in this direction of uh, developing 21st century skills and also student agency active learning to uh, get uh, both active and reflective uh, students. So let's take, for instance, this um, expert scenario where you can imagine um, you want to have your students uh, make a project on Brexit, uh, for instance, and you want, of course, to, to learn about it, learn what happened, maybe learn a little more about what's Europe and how it works, how we can get in and out. And uh, also you have this additional uh, goal about the collaboration you want to raise um, in the to raise, sorry, in, the, in, the, in your students' skills. So um, what you do is you're going to assign roles. So you can say, let's uh, have some, uh, in each group, I would like ha uh, to have a um, journalist and I would also have like to have um, um, like European institution experts. And let's say um, someone who said yes to the Brexit, someone who said no. So each group has um, a representative of the, each uh, let's say, field uh, of interest for, for the project on Brexit. So in the first phase, the students can um, talk together and uh, decide which role they're going to um, actually use or work on. And then what is the most interesting thing of the, the, the expert scenario is that in the second phase, you're going to um, let's say, uh, explode the groups. I'm not sure it's the proper word, but you're going to mingle the groups, but by actually gathering all the uh, journalists together and all the Europe, Europe um, experts together, the yes and the no together. So this is where they're going to um, be transformed into experts of their own domain. Um, this second part, you can actually assign task as a teacher, uh, different tasks depending on who they are, like some, um, let's say, um, work on the more the way you actually create a radio program when you're a journalist or a newspaper article and stuff like that. Um, so you give different um, resources to um, all the students and they have this opportunity to collaborate. Maybe some in the group, some are already experts and others not yet, but in the end, after the second phase, they must be responsible of something. It's their own domain of expertise. So when they come back to their group, then it's not like you have the best students explaining to others, like each student is actually the expert of his own domain and you have 
had a scenario, you have had a, a step uh, to make sure that it is uh, the case. And then when they gather, they can bring their own new acquired expertise to um, fulfill the project, whether it is like a radio show or um, any other um, any other product you want to build with them. So once you have this scenario, then you can ask yourself, where is the best learning space I would need uh, in order to have this uh, scenario being run the best way. And you can see that you need to move the chairs, you need to have some uh, open space maybe, or maybe outdoor is even better, so you have no walls to uh, kind of block you in your, in your moves. So uh, the idea was to build the space according to this scenario. And of course, um, the space has been built thinking about the expert scenario, but then once you have the space, it actually generates, creates new ideas for new scenarios. So from the idea of the FCL uh, to the reality, we actually try to adapt uh, in our specific context, those uh, learning zones, focusing here on the exchange zone, because for us, the expert was mostly about exchanging ideas and learning together. So this is uh, basically how we manage for each room, one scenario, one uh, ideal space, and then we got the lab. Uh, this is a list of things we did. We solved the problems. We got inspired by European Schoolnet. We adapted, we collaborate. And then we also needed to explain to uh, newcomers, to other teachers, because the focus group was uh, 25 uh, person, but uh, only uh, six or seven teachers. So of course we needed to uh, bring the others into uh, the project, which is very often a challenge. So this is what we actually do in the lab. We do mostly both things. The, the first one is to experiment. So these are for those who are used to um, uh, taking the most of the lab. But of course, there is the idea of sharing. So the door is open. You, you have this, um, I can fail, um, let's say, sentence that is kind of, um, let's say, hang up above the door, the main door of the room. So you can fail as a student, that's what we very often say as teachers, but we now say you can fail as a teacher. I mean, you can actually try something out different and maybe somehow you find out that it wasn't the best way to do it, wasn't the best way to teach, but you have the right to fail and actually um, identifying what went wrong can be very efficient in terms of professional development. So that's what we actually did. And um, as you can see on the right, uh, you have like a very active scenario running and you also have a teacher from another school that came to see how it was um, doing, I mean, how it was going on, like with so many students running everywhere. Was it like a mess or was it actually happening some uh, a lot of learning situations that maybe a teacher on his own cannot handle totally. And maybe it's not the point here, but to have as many teaching and learning situations as possible as you can, one can have. Um, I think I have been doing this for five years and then some, I, I, can, I could give a small update about it because um, after five years, what I realized is that if you really want teachers to get into it, because the, one of the main issue is, okay, you have a great idea and you want the others to kind of get inspired by it. I think that there is, to my experience, after like 15 years teaching, there is only one way, one real way to have your colleague actually um, getting inspired and transforming their um, way of teaching uh, is by not only observing, not only analyzing, not only reflecting on what they saw and so on, even if it could be very important. It's by doing with you. So you co-teach. That is, I think, the most efficient vector for um, dissemination of um, like innovative practices. Do things with your colleagues. So you can try to teach with two math colleagues, for instance, or all the science colleagues together. And if they are not used to active learning, then they will see you 
um, acting, I would say. They would see you doing your job in this context. They would try themselves. And this is very, very um, efficient, I have to admit, in the end. So I, I would just like to end this uh, presentation with the outcomes, because every time you experiment, every time you create a lab, it's a kind of maybe some people would say it's not, um, I mean, it's a small scale. Uh, you should be more ambitious. But uh, what is interesting with the small scale is that you can actually fail, you can actually learn from it. And now I would like to sh share just a list of a lot of different outcomes you can get from what you do in lab. From the material, from, from I mean, the most physical aspect, let's say the furnitures, to uh, the intellectual outcomes you can share. Because of course, a teacher can be inspired on another school can be uh, inspired by your furniture or your technology, but most of it, it will be inspired by the use of it. How do you use it actually? And maybe the setup, the of the setup of the rooms has been also uh, in very interesting, like how you actually organize the, the, the seatings and stuff. But even more interesting is like you can actually export, even if you don't have a lab, you can actually use the postures, the attitudes you had with your students. You can have it. You can have them again in normal classrooms, waiting for the classroom to be uh, aligned with your way of thinking. And of course, it goes up to the scenarios, the teaching styles, and in the end, probably the mindset too. And you will never come back again, even if a no in a normal classroom, you will be able to actually apply this uh, active learning concept that you kind of discovered in a lab in, in any s sort of situation. Um, in any school you can uh, actually teach in. So this is, are the six steps um, I wanted to share with you and um, I hope I will be able also to include these ideas in uh, the final report. You might also be able to read at some point. I thank you very much and uh, yes, thank you for um, listening to me. <laughs>